Welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to start to frame the day uh, a, a little bit so that you know how we approach this work and, and how we approach our partnership with you. First of all, um, no one gets anywhere on their own. We've all had mentors. And uh, I've been really blessed to have two terrific mentors in my life, among many others, but two very special ones. Uh, when I was a young college student, uh, thinking about going to law school, um, I talked my way into a job as a paralegal in this big law firm in Chicago. And uh, anyone who was foolish enough to make eye contact with me, uh, I asked them what they did. Uh, and there was a young attorney who uh, spent some time with me, invited me into her office, told me what she did for a living, gave me an opportunity to ask her some questions. Basically, she invested in me. And, uh, and she saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. She later introduced me to her fiance, this hotshot young lawyer named Barack Obama. <laughs> and I really can say that uh, having known the two of them as long as I have, I am uh, a better professional, uh, a better husband, a better father from their example and from their mentorship. And so I, I have really tried to go out of my way personally to uh, mentor anyone that I've had the opportunity to do so. And I'm surrounded by people here at the White House who have the same ethic uh, and who feel the same way. And at a time of such turmoil, such volatility, such economic hardship, mentoring is, is even more important. And, and you know that uh, taking a little bit of time in someone's life, it doesn't just do something for the person that you have the opportunity to mentor. It does something for yourself. Participating in your community, making your community a better place to live, it helps all of us. And so we have brought that work into the White House. We've had a great partnership with you, Big Brothers, Big Sisters. We have started our own mentoring program here. The boys uh, mentoring program, about 20 young men, high school age, from the Washington, D.C. Era that, area that are hooked up with White House staffers as mentors. They've done uh, amazing things. 20 young women uh, uh, who are from the Washington, D.C. area have participated in the White House mentoring program. Uh, I keep hearing from staffers what a great opportunity it is for them. Mentor, mentees have got a chance to do a couple of cool things. They've visited the Supreme Court. They've had a chance to visit Air Force One. They've hung out with Bo. <laughs> and they've met the President and the First Lady of the United States. We just had a graduation ceremony for those who graduated, and for the, for the entire program that graduated uh, just this past weekend. We're about to bring on another 40 uh, young men and women into the White House. So we have, uh, we've done this ourselves uh, because we know what a, what a privilege it is to be here uh, and our responsibility to reach out uh, and help others. And so uh, we have a lot of groups that come into the White House and sit down and, and, and talk with us. And we're going to have a parade of senior officials who want to come in uh, and meet you and share a little bit about what we're doing, because we know something else. You all are leaders in your community. People follow you. People listen to you. You have credibility. And so when you go back home and just, just tell them a little bit about us. You know, sometimes people can get a bit cynical about government. Tell them what you saw. Tell them what you learned. Tell them what you thought was great. Tell them what you thought was full of beans and all wet. But just the fact that you're engaging with us, I think, is important. It's important to us. Uh, I hope it's important to you and it'll be important to, uh, to the people back home. 
so uh, with that, uh, I want to turn this over to a, uh, a, a young attorney who uh, I first met when he was a college student at the University of Illinois. He graduated and went on to law school, started his own practice, was doing pretty well until I told him, forget about all that. Uh, I need you to come to Washington, D.C., take a gigantic pay cut and, uh, and, and come work with me. He is the uh, leader of disability outreach and the leader of disability policy for the Domestic Policy Council, Kareem Dale. Thanks, Kareem. I was going to give you a different introduction, but then I saw you standing there, so I knew you could hear me. Thanks, everyone. See you later. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks Mike. And uh, welcome to the White House to everybody. And uh, we're certainly thrilled to have all of you all here. And for those who may be watching online on the live stream, we're certainly pleased to have all of you all uh, watching online as well. So uh, we have a good agenda for you all today. Hopefully everybody's picked up the agenda uh, when you walked in. I will kind of be back and forth periodically uh, to bridge the gap between different folks and to give you some additional information about what we're doing, things we're doing here uh, at the White House that we think are, think we think was very interesting to you all. We think it's beneficial for you all to know, but we also think it's uh, beneficial uh, from our standpoint to make sure that you know uh, what the president is doing, what the president is up to, what our administration is up to, and what uh, the White House uh, at large is up to. So uh, we obviously have coming up next uh, Tina Chen, who's the First Lady's Chief of Staff, and Tina will be here uh, in a few minutes. And then we have George uh, Shelton from um, the, uh, oh, no, sorry, next is uh, after Tina is Joshua Dubois, uh, who's the head of our faith office, and then we also have George Shelton, uh, and then to be concluded by the Attorney General. So we have a, a good lineup for you all today. And so let me just talk about a few things while we, while, um, we wait for Tina to arrive in the next few minutes. The, as, as Mike said, I have two, two roles here. Uh, well, actually, I have three roles here. Um, you have three roles plus whatever else might come up in the interim that uh, the administration that the president or Valerie or anybody else needs you to do. So we have, you know, some defined roles, but, you know, we're the jack of all trades, particularly in the Office of Public Engagement. So as Mike said, I do disability policy uh, in the Domestic Policy Council. I also do in the Office of Public Engagement, which is Valerie Jarrett's, one of Valerie Jarrett's offices. I do outreach to the disability community, but I also do outreach to lawyers and the civil rights community. Uh, I think I got stuck with that. Actually, Tina is my uh, former boss in the Office of Public Engagement before she went over to the First Lady's office. And she's a lawyer from Chicago as well. And so I think when she saw that I was coming, she just decided, well, I know you. You're a lawyer from Chicago. I'm a lawyer from Chicago, so you do lawyers. So that's how, that's how I got stuck with that. Uh, but it's, but it's, been a, uh, it's been a good gig. So within the Office of Public Engagement, um, we do a number of things. And we are the front door to the White House. So it's our job to make sure that you all know uh, what's going on here at the White House, what the president is up to. Uh, it's our job to make sure that we're communicating to you all as constituents about things that are important to you and to your communities across the country. It's also our job to listen to you and to bring you to uh, events like this and briefings so you can hear uh, from us, but that also we can hear from you, and you'll have you'll have a chance to ask questions to some of our to some of our briefers today. Um, we want to have have a chance to hear from you, and to make sure that we understand where you're coming from. And this is something that we we do quite a bit here uh, in the Office of Public Engagement, bringing in constituents really from around the country, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, doesn't matter to us. We want to hear from all Americans uh, to make sure that that is. Uh, that, that you all are advising us on what you think our policy should be uh, related to, to your communities. And so we've developed a number of different tools uh, and so that we can do that and so that we can hear from you and so that we can understand where you're coming from, but also so that, uh, so that you can hear from us. Uh, our new director, our new director, I guess he's no, no longer new. I know he's been here for maybe, gosh, I think John's been here since... December or November now? I, I, I lose track. I, I've been here since day one, so um, it, it gets a little, 
uh, things get a little run together. But John has been here several months. John Carson is our director of the Office of uh, uh, Public Engagement. And so he has developed a number of tools for us to communicate with everybody uh, throughout the country. And so let me just uh, tell you about, let me make sure, uh, Catherine, Tina's not here yet, right? Is Catherine out there? Catherine. Okay, all right, she's all right. So while we, I'm going to tell you about a couple of these tools uh, that I think are beneficial to you all, that you all should know about. One of those tools is what's called the Community Leaders Briefing. And the Community, Le community Leaders Briefing is, it's, it's actually not that much different than uh, what we're doing today uh, with you all. What we do is we bring in leaders, uh, community leaders from a particular uh, constituency or a particular place in the country or a particular group of people that are leaders in their local communities, that are doing great things, that are, that are leading their communities uh, across the country. And we bring those community leaders in and we have a dialogue with White House administration officials and White House officials and administration officials uh, from particular agencies. So uh, we'll bring in those community leaders, we'll bring in, you know, 100 to 150 community leaders uh, they'll, they'll have a chance to come here and hear from administration officials, which is the part that's very similar uh, to what we're doing here today. They'll have a chance to hear from, hear from administration officials in their relevant areas. We'll do a briefing. We'll do that here. They'll have a chance to ask questions. And then we'll have breakout sessions in the afternoon where uh, those, those, those leaders break up into, you know, four, five, six different breakout groups and have a chance to ask questions of administration officials and really kind of dig down deep into some of the issues that are concerning them in their local communities. And it's, it's just another way for us to reach out to local communities because, you know, we get kind of tied up here in Washington and, you know, we think the world only exists in Washington. But we realize that we need to be communicating and talking to communities across the country. And so that's one way that we do that. So I say that to say that you should go out and check out um, our website, the Office of Public Engagement website, on the White House website. And, you know, if you think that there is an opportunity, a community leaders briefing, um, that you think, oh, the, you know, these set of or group of persons or a particular constituency um, might be interested in having a community, community leaders briefing, then you can email me and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at it and we'll consider it and we'll figure out if there's a, if there's a way to do it. Um, uh, obviously, we're doing this already for Big Brothers Big Sisters, so it would be something different, uh, but that you might, you know, I'm sure all of you all are involved in other organizations, other groups and things of that nature. So that's one one idea. The second thing that, second tool that we've done in order to highlight people that are doing great things around the country, we've created Champions of Change. Let, let me ask, how many, how many people have actually heard of Community Leaders Briefing or Champions of Change? Have any of you all heard of that? If you raise your hands, I'm blind if you didn't see the cane. Please don't, don't raise your hands, you know. Y'all are the ones that look crazy, not me. Because <laughs> I, I know I'm blind, so if y'all didn't see the cane, then y'all ones look like, oh. Duh, why did I raise my hand? He can't see me. So, um, so maybe just clap for any of those that have that have heard of Community Leaders Briefing or Champions of Change. Okay, a few of you all, a few of you all. All right, uh, not nearly enough though. So, Champions of Change was something that that uh, we developed to really highlight people that are really doing great things around their country. I'll give you an example. We did a Champions of Change in my in my disability role. We did a Champions of Change. Um, for those persons who are doing great things in STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math, for people with disabilities. And we had some, you know, great people. Actually, it was, uh, well, I don't know. It, it, we had some really, really great people. And there were stories done um, in various news outlets, or really across the country, uh, a lot of good publicity. And we highlight generally about 12 to 14 people. And we bring them into the White House, we highlight them, we do a blog about it, we tweet about it, and we do a couple of different uh, panel discussions. Um, we do panel discussions with the different champions to talk about the issues. And we invite, you know, 100 or so people to come in, their guests as well as uh, different people from that particular community to come in and listen to the panel discussions. We also give the champions a tour of the White House. And it's just a great way to really signal that 
um, our belief that it is not only about government, it is not government alone that is going to make a difference in our communities, but it's people like you all that are making a difference every day, and it's a chance for us to highlight some of those champions that are really doing phenomenal things. So if you take a look at our champions website, I mean, you'll see we've had champions in business and environment, we've had champions uh, in, in, I think, teachers, and, and just all sorts of different areas where we've had champions of change. And so if you take a look at that and you think, wow, I have an idea for a Champions of Change program, then you know, let us know, and we will, we will also consider that. So, so really, those are two really great tools for us to get involved. Let me, let me stop for a second, um, take a few questions. If anybody has questions that they want to ask about, generally the Office of Public Engagement, the work I do, um, while, and then we'll just have, we'll move into Tina as soon as Tina gets here. Um, I have some other stuff that I'm going to download for you all uh, as, the, as the briefing progresses. So, so uh, any questions right now? If you have questions, just you can just shout out. <laughs> I don't mind. Uh, any questions, Jack? Over here. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Just a uh, quick question. Uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters is pleased to have the chance to be here. Thank you very much for hosting us. Uh, our local agencies around the country uh, are obviously con consider themselves and, and have been for many years, for decades, leaders in child safety and in youth outcomes. Uh, one of the things that we need in addition to resources are more volunteers. And as, uh, through the Office of Public Engagement, are there ways that the White House can encourage different constituent groups to come forward and serve as big brothers, big sisters around the country? Well, I think, I think what we have tried to do is, while, you know, it's, it gets a little complicated if you start talking about, you know, ask people to volunteer for specific organizations, I think what we've tried to do is the President and the First Lady have really highlighted volunteerism. And we've put a big emphasis on that. And the main emphasis that has been through is through the Corporation for National Community Service. And really encouraging people to get out and volunteer um, in your local communities and organizations that you uh, appreciate and that you want to help out. And obviously, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters would be one of those organizations where, where folks can volunteer and do uh, mentoring. But there are you know, obviously many other organizations uh, as well. And so, um, obviously, I would, I would encourage, um, I think you all, I assume you all probably have a partnership in some capacity with Co Corporation for National Community Service. If not, we can certainly help uh, facilitate that uh, additional conversations with, uh, the, with the corporation. But we, 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 we believe, as you heard Mike talk about, we certainly believe in community service, and we are uh, pushing uh, individuals to volunteer and get involved in their communities. Uh, because the president and first lady really believe in that uh, as well, so we'll, we, you know, we can certainly work on that. Yeah. Other questions at this point? Okay. All right. So let's. Uh, we'll give it. Give me a couple minutes, and we'll wait for uh, Tina to arrive. Oh, Tina's here. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. You know. They've been raising their hands and knowing. I told them I couldn't see them, Tina. So, you know, right at home. So, uh, as you heard me talk a little bit about Tina earlier. Um, so, without further ado, the First Lady's Chief of Staff and my former boss, Tina Chin. Thank you, Kareem. Uh, Kareem is, you've already seen, is sort of one of our um, best spokespersons and role models and, you know, is just out, in a, you know, um, on all sorts of issues. Um, so he has been just a terrific leader around the country um, and for young people. Um, I am delighted to be here. Um, uh, I actually wear two hats here at the White House. I am uh, Mrs. Obama's chief of staff um, and ha after having served the first two years of the administration as the director of the Office of Public Engagement. So in that former capacity, I spent a lot of time with Big Brothers Big Sisters as part of our outreach effort. So I'm, I'm a great admirer of all the work that all of you do. Um, my second hat is I'm also the executive director of the White House Council on Women and Girls, um, which is chaired by Valerie Jarrett. And it is our council consisting of all of the agencies in the federal government and all of the major White House offices. Um, uh, that really promotes, pursuant to the President's directive in the executive order, that 
um, he, when he cre that he signed when he created the council back in March of 2009 um, to make sure that every part of the federal government pays attention to the needs of women and girls in everything that we do. Um, and certainly making sure that young women and girls really reach their full potential um, in things like STEM education, um, in leadership capacities, um, in much of what all of you do, I know, as, as mentors um, is part of um, our mission here and what we do. Um, for the First Lady's Office, um, as many of you know from our, her own personal history, um, mentorship is a concept that she feels quite strongly about. Um, very oftentimes when she speaks to young people, not just here in the United States, but um, a key part of many of her foreign um, speeches when she's, whether it's in Brazil or in India or more recently last summer in, in South Africa, um, she talks to young people you know, about her own personal narrative um, and about how she, you, know, you, know, you can be anything you want to be um, and how her own life story demonstrates that and the importance then of paying it forward um, and of mentorship. Um, her own personal story is, as, as you all know, one where she, um, after you know, graduating from Princeton, Harvard Law School, going to work at Salih um, Austin, a, bit, a big um, national law firm based in Chicago, um, then made the decision to leave that um, and you know, to work both in city government, but importantly, to work for public allies, um, to really be at the ground level of that organization that really promotes um, young adults working in um, inner cities um, and on programs and with disconnected youth and providing that kind of, of growth and mentorship. And she has seen herself very much as a mentor to many of those public allies folks. Um, and I now see it as we travel around the country. Um, more often than not, when we're in, a, in, in an event and holding some sort of grassroots rally or something else, um, people will come up having been high school students that she mentored or co college students who are now people who are administrators administrators or executives or work for state government. Um, and we tried to replicate and model mentorship here at the White House. So from early on, as many of you may know, we have had the First Lady started a White House mentorship program. We will, in fact, tomorrow hold a graduation ceremony for our, our second group um, of graduates who will be graduating from high school. Um, we, we, we started it when we first got here and had a group of, of at that point, um, sophomores and juniors. And we graduated um, that first group that became seniors last year and our second group this year. And we've had a new group come in. Um, and um, this year, um, we had one for the girls because we organized that from the East Wing. This year, we've told the West Wing, we'll let the boys come in, too, <laughs> and, and be part of the graduation ceremony. The president, run, it, um, his staff, runs a, a mentorship program for boys as well. Um, and it's it's been terrific. It's been a labor of love for many of us here in the White House. Um, it, the, the mentors are a collection of White House staffers. Um, and um, we also do then organize group events for all of them. We've had great participation from um, places like George Washington. Washington University, who has sent over many of their staff to do Saturday morning writing seminars um, for these kids and career counseling. And, you know, we've been able to take them on visits to Air Force One and to, to the, get to the Capitol building. And every year they come with us to the Women of Courage Awards event um, that Secretary Clinton gives, gives out. Um, we've been able to give them previews of state dinners. Um, so it's been, I hope, exciting for them. Um, it's been tremendously rewarding for all of us. Uh, because as I don't have to tell all of you, um, you know, mentorship is, is a two-way street. You know, you get as much out of it as a mentor as, as you give and put in for these young people. Um, so that has been, you know, really a constant theme um, that I think the President and the First Lady have promoted um, as part of their overall message and support of public service um, as a whole. Um, it's a theme that carried through the recent um, report of the Commission on Community Solutions that just finished its work last week and submitted a report to the President um, uh, on recommendations for carrying the work forward to stay involved with disconnected youth, you know, especially our older youth who are not in school, not employed, um, and how we re-reach re those kids. Um, and in our work that we recently did in Chicago um, when we hosted the NATO summit, 
there about three weeks ago. Um, and what the First Lady was able to do, every, every part of the summit has a spousal program where the spouses of the visiting leaders um, participate in a separate program. And what we were able to do um, for that event was to take those spouses to the Gary Comer Youth Center, which is a youth center that Gary Comer, the um, founder um, uh, of Land's End, created in his old neighborhood on the south side of Chicago, which is just a few blocks from where the First Lady grew up, um, and is now a full service center for youth, um, both after school and before school, and they started a charter high school, um, and really is an embodiment of how um, people in our community can be engaged with youth, and we were able to um, show that to um, the NATO leader spouses, um, the um, First Lady of Nor Norway, uh, who's a, quite an expert in, in these, having been to several summits, actually told me it was the best spousal program they had ever had, because they're used to seeing a lot of museums and, and, and lovely places that, they're sh that are shown off, usually by, by heads of state. Um, but they don't often get to see actually really having you know, an engagement with the community. And it was a, it's a terrific center, and the kids were really our um, tour directors, you know, all throughout, who were terrific spokespeople. Um, and real examples of what mentorship and what you all do with Big Brothers and Big Sisters, um, uh, uh, the, the, the kinds of molding of, of young lives that you, that you all do every day. So my message is, I guess, you know, just really very brief and twofold, um, and that is to thank you for the work that I know all of you do um, uh, across the country, you know, every day with your mentors, um, supporting them and recruiting them, with your mentees, um, supporting them um, in, in their lives. Um, and to make sure that you know that you have great supporters and partners in both the East Wing and the West Wing of the White House. Um, you know, really people throughout the administration who know what important work it is that you do, um, who are great supporters of the work that you do. Um, and that, you know, we look forward to continuing to expand that work um, and to figure out ways in which we can, you know, send along and continue to promote the, men the message of mentorship um, throughout um, everything that we do. So thank you again. Um, with that, I'm, you know, free, you know, I can take a couple of questions if people have got some. Yes. Yes, I'm Paul Bliss, CEO of Big Brothers Big Sisters in Washington, D.C., and we've had the privilege of hosting uh, the Obama family uh, for approximately two hours painting a school for Martin Luther King Day. And I know there's an awful lot of Big Brother Big Sister agencies across the country that would love to be able to host the president or the first lady. How would they go about doing that? Obviously, there's re-elections, there's traveling throughout the uh, country. I'm certain that there'd be opportunities for us to host the first family. Well, um, and we have had a wonderful time here in, in, in the D.C. community. Um, Sure, it is, travel's always a little challenging. It's going to be particularly challenging this year um, with the remaining 149 days, I gather, that there are between now and November 6th, <laughs> just to pick a date off the calendar. Um, uh, <laughs> Uh, but, you know, we are certainly, um, you know, and Kareem, you know, can be your contact at, at public engagement um, if there are particular invites um, that you all have or particular ideas um, for things. Um, feel free to, to send them in and send them along, you know, through, through Kareem and his team, and they'll get them over to us um, to, to consider. You know, we're, we are, you know, happy, you know, happy to consider those. Um, uh, but uh, I will, you know, beg your indulgence and your patience, you know, as, as we work our ways, you know, through, you know, what are, what are lots of requests but you know as I said these these are important issues you know to the president and the first lady and so you know any we'd w welcome ideas yes Hello. I do <laughs> okay how are you we spent many years together in Chicago with the Department of Children and Family Services we won't talk about that anymore <laughs> <laughs> so it's what it's just great to see you and the second thing is uh, connecting with your office and Helping Big Brothers Big Sisters expose more of the work that it's doing. Particularly, I was very interested in what Kareem talked about, of highlighting some of the matches, the longevity of those matches. We just had a match that lasted four children, had 24 years of mentoring from us. All four went to college, two have graduated, and two are on their way to graduating. That is the kind of community story I'd like to see on the website or some way that we can do that. 
So if you don't mind, may I call you? <laughs> of course, you can do that. And Kar Kareem really is, um, you know, we rely on, on him. Um, also as a contact, but you know, um, you know, he can he can get you through to me, um, and, and and I think you know, trying to um, really pass that word along and ch highlight stories. We we're always looking for, um, you know, we call them real real person stories, um, uh, but um, those things that really convey. You know, we we have found actually telling an individual story is sometimes you know the most powerful thing. You know, I should mention one of the things I, I wanted in particular to mention um, from the first lady's office that we have spent the last year um, working on, and I know I think many of your, your chapters have as well, um, and that is our Joining Forces Initiative. So a year ago, April, the First Lady started the second of her initiatives. The first one is our Let's Move Initiative on Childhood Obesity. But the second one is on uh, Joining Forces, which really works to address the issues concerning our military families. Our veterans, our active duty, reserve, um, uh, uh, military families, um, in particular, um, not just the service member themselves, but also their spouse and their children. Um, and this is something the First Lady, you know, really learned about on the campaign trail and talking to many of these um, spouses and realizing the tremendous challenges that these families have. Um, they have, you know, after 10 years of war with an all-volunteer force, um, we really have 1% of the country that is serving to protect the 99% of us. And I, I count myself in that 99% not coming from a military family. Uh, but I've now had the privilege of meeting these incredible families. Um, these are folks whose kids you know, probably went to 10, high, 10 schools before they graduate high school because their parent has deployed and moved so many times. Um, they are families who have um, uh, endured having their military family members, sometimes it's actually both parents, um, you know, serve multiple deployments, you know, not just once, usually two, three, four, five, even six times, you know, deployed into a war zone. Um, and these are kids who are incredibly resilient um, and like their families are pretty stoic. Um, um, and, 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 and incredibly patriotic, but kids who really deserve our help. Um, and, you know, I know, you know, uh, mentoring and providing, you know, that kind of guidance that you all do so well for our military kids um, would be, you know, a terrific service. And it's not just the kids who are near a military base, because in many ways that com those communities are pretty visible and have stepped up. Um, our reserve, so in Illinois, you know, we really have Illinois guard, guard you know, um, units that have deployed. And then those, those, those folks are spread out through our communities. They're not near a base. So you may have a kid, you know, who is the only kid in their school who is going through a deployment. Um, and finding those kids and finding ways to connect and support those kids um, is something that um, we, is, is, I think, a really important service and something that you all can uniquely provide to them. One more? No, no more. I think we answered it all. Well, thank you again for all the work that you do. Oh, wait, one more. Comment on how you think Big Brothers Big Sisters could be uh, relevant in helping the council on women and girls? Well, absolutely. Um, you know, we would, you know, again, I think that what you do, you know, mentorship and providing role models for young girls um, is, is very important. Um, one area that we have been able to spend a lot of time on here um, at the White House and through the council has been in the area of STEM education. In fact, I just came from a, a bilateral session this morning with um, a delegation from India where we were trying to find ways to support women and girls in, in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Um, but we have tried to do that across the board. You know, we know that we lose you know, starting after the fourth grade, you know, girls where their girls and boys' interest is about the same in math and science, that it starts to fall off pretty precipitously, you know, past that point. And these are the jobs of the future. You know, even though women are half the workforce now, they're only 25% of the careers in the STEM fields. And we are not only losing our girls, and our girls are losing the, the ability to, to, to access those careers, which are both where the jobs are going to be in an economy of the future and where the higher paying jobs are going to be, uh, we as a country are losing out on that talent. 
Um, and so getting, you know, doing, providing mentorship at a young age for these um, uh, young girls is going to be pretty key. Um, so recruiting, we've tried to actually tap into our federal scientists um, uh, in our workforce to provide that mentorship opportunity. I think big brothers and big sisters could do that as well. But that's not just in the STEM area. Um, we have the next area that we'd like to do more in, I will, you know, be quite candid to say that we haven't spent enough time on, uh, but would like to do some more on, is the more general area of um, girls' self-esteem. I mean, I think building the self-esteem of our young girls and women, and I say this as the mom of a 15-year-old daughter, um, is so important with all of the other counter-messaging that they are exposed to that, are, that, that is out there. Again, I think mentors um, provide that sounding board, an alternative role model, a, a, an alternative you know, ear and, and support to these young girls who are fighting against a lot of cultural messaging that's different, um, and in many cases, you know, even worse, you know, kinds of vulnerabilities and dangers, whether it's dangers at home and vulnerabilities at home or externally. Um, uh, and I think you know, making sure that we are connected to those young girls and, and we would welcome, you know, um, greater partnership. Um, we have a Deputy Director Avra Siegel who works in the, with me and Hallie Schneier who is one of Karim's colleagues in the Office of Public Engagement who is devoted to women and girls outreach. And again, Kareem can get you in touch, you know, with us more specifically if there's specific things um, you want to connect with the Council Women and Girls on, we would again welcome Welcome that as well. So again, thank you. And we hope you enjoyed your day at the White House and, and we thank you again for all the work that you do every day. All right, thank you very much, Tina. Um, it's always uh, you know, there's there's a few of us around here that have been around here since uh, since day one, and and go back to the transition. Tina is one of those uh, one of my colleagues here who uh, we came in on day one when it was a little, you know we didn't quite know where all the bathrooms were and where everything was going on. So uh, we spent a long time here, and uh, it's been a, it's been a great journey. So um, while we wait for Joshua, a couple of other uh, things I want to do. Um, the first thing is when we, you know, we talk about, uh, you hear, you've heard uh, Tina and you heard Mike say it, if you, the questions you have about participating in events or getting in contact with Tina or the Council of Women and Girls, uh, we actually, we're very serious about that. So if you uh, do want to make those connections, I'm happy to help make those connections, particularly because it won't go, it won't be me having to do the work. I'll be able to put it off on my colleagues. So I'm always happy to give my colleagues more work. And so, uh, but if you, if you make that contact, uh, Kelly, your government relations uh, person has my email address and contact information. Kelly, you're free to give it to any of these folks. And we will make those uh, connections with you. And that, that reminds me, I want to thank Kelly for all of her uh, work in getting this done. Um, she did a phenomenal job and um, <laughs> believe you me, uh, doing something here at the White House like this, uh, we, we put a lot of demands on her to get us all the information, get it right, get it by a specific time, and this, that, and the other. So she did a great job. So we, we appreciate all of her efforts in making the event easy for us. Um, is Joshua here? He usually just like yells out at me or something, something crazy. So, um, so, uh, but let, so, just if you have, if you really do want to connect, you know, I'll second what what Tina said about you know the uh, young man who asked about the events. I mean, the schedule is incredibly tight for the president and first lady, so it's very difficult. And a lot of times, it's you know maybe we get an opportunity for some sort of off the record thing at the last minute. Um, so, but it's incredibly difficult to get things on the schedule. So just bear with us and keep that in mind. Um, you know, but the uh, First Lady's office is really great about connecting, particularly about her core initiatives, um, whether it be joining forces or um, um, uh, childhood obesity, let's move. Those are her two core initiatives. The Council of Women and Girl was, Girls would go through the two young ladies that uh, Tina mentioned. So happy to make those connections, and our team is always looking for really uh, great opportunities. So I have more to say to you, but I don't want Joshua yelling at me. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce you to uh, the head of our faith-based office and another one of my colleagues that has been here since uh, day one and is a long time uh, friends work for the President's Senate office as well, Joshua Dubois. Wonderful. 
Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here and to bring you greetings on behalf of the, of the president and the entire White House, um, uh, and also on behalf of a fellow big brother myself. Um, this is my crowd here. I, um, I was, I was, when I was, I was walking over here, and I was recalling the first moment um, that I met my little. I was at the, the top floor. Anybody been to Big Brothers of Mass Bay by chance? Yeah. There we go. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> so anyway, it's in, a, it's in a high-rise building. At least it was at the time. And um, we were in this conference room at the top floor. And the dread and fear that filled my soul <laughs> when I thought about the, this responsibility that I was entering into. Um, and then I saw this little kid um, with these huge eyes looking up at me. And I had no idea what I was going to do, but I knew it was going to be a good thing. And that was, gosh, 13 or 14 years ago. We've been hanging out ever since. Um, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I knew it was... Um, much more than you know than just kind of a programmatic connection when he went on his Facebook page and you, you know you add your siblings on there and he added me as a brother to his <laughs> to his Facebook page and I almost got emotional when, when I saw that that happen so um, Adid is now he, he was um, you know he was a wonderful kid then facing a number of challenges in his life his father was incarcerated but I'm happy to say he just finished up his freshman year at Morehouse College and so we are delighted by his, his progress. And it's just a wonderful example of what you all do every single day. Um, and, and, and it's the small things that matter. It's the match support folks reaching out to us and let, uh, making sure things are on track, even when we ignore them. And I'm sorry, guys. I, <laughs> I was quite delinquent, but I was still, Hadid and I were still connecting. But um, it took me a couple weeks to return phone calls. But, um, or, or, you know, the opportunities that we, we went to baseball games at Fenway and ice skating and all sorts of things. You know, years later, these things stick with us and they matter. Um, and, you know, Adid, I'm, I'm positive, is going to be a future leader in this country. He is going to finish up at Morehouse and maybe run for office or impact kids in other ways. And, and, and I was excited to, um, uh, to talk to him a couple weeks ago, and he said he's going to uh, reach out to his own local big brothers and, uh, and when the time is right, become a big brother himself. And so uh, you know that your work matters, but on behalf of the president, I want to affirm that it matters so much for so many young men and women all around, uh, all across our country. Um, so I, I lead the Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. And my job is to work uh, through our offices at 13 federal agencies to connect the administration to local nonprofits, both uh, faith-based and secular. For example, we have an office at the Department of Labor that works with local congregations and nonprofits on job training programs, getting them set up and running. We have an office at um, the de uh, Department of uh, Agriculture that works on food and nutrition issues with local congregations and nonprofits at the Department of Justice and Education, and, and on and on. We manage the government's relationship with local groups around the country. Um, and we are also one of, the, of several advocates for mentoring in the administration. Um, I've, I've been uh, particularly pleased to work with my colleagues at the Department of Justice on making sure that the funding for mentoring programs like Big Brothers continues um, uh, and strengthens in some ways. We're, I was very delighted last year that we are able to support, um, in, a, in somewhat of a new way, uh, uh, mentoring of, um, of, ju uh, of um, uh, juvenile offenders uh, to the tune of about $13 million in, um, in, in an impactful way. Thank you. <laughs> And what we're trying to do is kind of weave mentoring into uh, federal programs that may be distinct from mentoring. For example, workforce development. Um, you know, well, if you're thinking about um, you know, how to make sure that, that young people are connected to jobs, well, one thing they need is a good mentor in their life that reminds them um, about uh, you know, the, the importance of going to work and finding employment. Um, if you're looking at, um, at uh, ex-offender reentry, which we've talked about, or, or uh, substance abuse, well, one thing that it would be great to, for folks who are receiving counseling and support for substance problems to have a, a mentor that comes alongside them and supports them as well. So we're trying to cross-pollinate mentoring across um, other federal programs and federal agencies, and, and our office does a lot of that work advocating um, uh, for mentoring across the administration. We are open to new ideas. For example, we, we've been participating in some conversations recently about how, in, the, in, the, in light of the, um, the cuts to the Mentoring Children of Prisoners program, how potentially the Department of Justice can partner with HHS to support some of that good work. If there are other ideas, in fact, I was uh, talking with one of our mentoring leads at DOJ on the way over here, 
Um, we want to hear from you. Uh, we don't want this to be a one-way conversation. Um, there's a lot going on at any given moment. I have 13 um, agency offices I'm running, and other folks are doing a lot of work. And so don't assume that we have all the ideas and info we need um, to support mentoring. We don't. We need your feedback. We need uh, to be in conversation and dialogue with you. I'm going to give everyone my email address so we can keep the conversation going from here. Um, for any tweeters in the room, any folks on Twitter in here, I'm also at Joshua Dubois as well. So, um, and I uh, respond to those frequently. Uh, my email address is jdubois, J-D-U-B-O-I-S, at W-H-O, dot E-O-P dot gov. I'll give that again. J Dubois, J D U B O I S at W H O is in White House Office dot E O P Executive Office of the President dot gov. And I'd love to continue the conversation with you all. Um, but, you know, most importantly, thank you for the good work you do. I am just one of thousands of big brothers and big sisters who is deeply appreciative of this wonderful organization. Um, you're changing lives every single day. That's, that's, people say that a lot, but, you know, I've seen it in, in my own life and in Adid's life as well. And on behalf of the president, I want to appreciate your good work. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Right. Um, thank you very much to Joshua. So our next speaker, uh, as you see from your agenda, is from Department of Health and Human Services, the Administration on Children and Families. Please give a warm welcome to uh, George Young. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, do we have any Floridians here? All right. I, I just want to make sure. Uh, I've only been with the federal government for the last uh, 12 months. I had this nice, quiet job in Florida running the Florida Department of Children and Families. And, uh, and, and so they decided to open me up to the federal government, and I'm really trying to learn how this process works. If uh, my deputy in Florida, when I came here, said that Washington is 76 square miles surrounded by reality. Uh, and, and, I, but I, and I think that Joshua made this point is that all knowledge doesn't reside here. It really is out in the communities, and, and I've learned that so much. I would also say that there have been better times to be the Assistant Secretary of, of the Administration for Children and Families. I would love to have been Assistant Secretary in the 90s when uh, the federal government was flush with dollars and we were expanding, uh, but these are different times. I mean, you know that. Um, uh, you've seen the recent poverty numbers uh, among children. One in every five children in this country live in poverty. Uh, it's, it's even worse for African Americans, about 38 percent, 35 percent for Hispanics. Uh, it's upwards to almost 50 percent uh, with children who are growing up in single parent families. And that's four times uh, the rate of uh, poverty among kids in two parent families. And, and so children are much more at risk today uh, than probably ever before. And, and, and a lot of things add to that. I was uh, in San Diego uh, just uh, this last Thursday uh, and met with the um, uh, Federal Task Force on Human Trafficking at the high school, Glen, uh, Glenmont uh, Unified uh, School District, and, uh, and came you know, stark in the face of active recruiting in, in that high school and other high schools uh, for children uh, to be trafficked. Uh, it is a whole new phenomenon of, 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 and these are children who are um, disaffected, who uh, may not have the best of all home life. And, that's, and that combined with everything else is the, real, is the re reason that partnerships with entities like Big Brothers and Big Sisters is so important. And I'm not just saying that, that's a reality. Uh, when I first got to the department in Florida, and I, I sat down with about 15 uh, young kids who aged out of foster care. And these were kids in their, you know, 20, 21, 25. And, you know, it was one of those kind of things when you do, when you just become an agency head and you think, well, I gotta go buy this. So, I'll spend about 20 minutes, make a few comments, and well, two and a half hours later, 
I think I learned more from those 15 kids about uh, foster care than I've learned from all the professionals, and I'm not taking anything away from professionals. Uh, but uh, we designed really a whole child welfare system in this country, and we never talked to kids. Uh, and and, and, I, and I think that's, I mean, I think that's so important. And what I learned from those kids was almost to a child they said I would have rather stayed at home and dealt with some of the issues out of my home than to going into a child welfare system where I was passed from home to home, school to school. And I don't care if you're in 10 good foster homes, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that if you're in that many homes, you begin to believe as a child you don't belong anywhere. Uh, and that is so important, uh, that is the reason that mentors are so important. Uh, whether uh, a brother figure or, or sister figure or a father figure or a mother figure is so important to these kids, whether it's children in the child welfare system, those children who are susceptible to human trafficking uh, in, in Glenmont uh, High School. Uh, it is so important to have that connection. The other thing I learned from those kids was how important one human being was in their life. It may have been another foster child, uh, it may have been a foster parent, it may have been their caseworker, but in many cases it was a mentor. Somebody who took the time to do something with them uh, that they looked for every week. The, th the third thing I really learned is how important being normal is to them and doing normal things. Uh, and if you look at child welfare systems, they're really designed to be risk adverse. You know, let's not allow something to happen because we're going to be sued as a result of it. So we, we you know, I, when I was, I, I was speaking to a group of foster parents in Clearwater, actually, and, and, and afterwards some of these foster parents came over to me and said that we had a dangerous activity czar in the department. I said, no, we don't. <laughs> she said, yes, you do. Well, we did. We had this woman who approved what foster children could do. Uh, well, you can be part of Boy Scouts, but you can't participate in archery. I mean, it's, it, I mean I'm mean, i serious about this. And so I basically said, you know, you can do something else in the department, and we created what we called a, <laughs> we created what I called a normal Caesar. Uh, and because what, that's what kids want to be. They, they want to go to, the, they don't want the near, latest we game or iPad or most of them want to go to the prom or they want to learn how to drive. 90% of kids in the foster care system age out without a driver's license. My goddaughter, when she was old enough to get a learner's permit, she had dad up at 7 a.m. Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, we also use all these non-normal words in child welfare. Uh, you know, foster kids are in multiple placements. Regular kids grow up in several different homes. You know, foster parents need respite care. Regular parents need a vacation. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, 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 it's uh, and I think it's a mindset we really kind of have to get out to. Uh, the, um, but I, I do think uh, that uh, I've been mentoring a young man for several years uh, and uh, I, just got an opportunity. He was in foster care for 11 years, and uh, uh, I just had an opportunity to robe him at his graduation from law school. Which is, uh, and because a lot of these kids who have uh, who are disaffected, who have whether it's foster care or whether it's poverty or whatever, these are these are good kids, and generally pretty bright if they're given that opportunity to dream and to think beyond themselves. And I think that's the reason the partnerships, uh, I will tell you that having been now at state government, now in the federal government, government cannot do it all. We, we, uh, we, can, we can provide some resources and that's becoming more and more limited. We can provide some overall direction, but in reality, communities have to take it upon themselves. And that's the reason that I think uh, big brothers, big sisters are, are so important. I'm also a strong proponent of Best Buddies uh, because I think they've had a, this, this, this issue of working with kids with, with disabilities. So the extent to which we can work with you 
Uh, I know that these are particularly tough times to get in the door of a state agency uh, with the limited budgets that, that they're constricting. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, I sent out uh, uh, with my counterpart at the Department of Labor a, a letter to uh, commissioners around the country uh, pointing out the use of TANF funds and the TANF in use, in use for summer jobs for young kids is an allowable expense to count against their maintenance of effort and, and that they really ought to be thinking in those terms. I think when you're trying to access those kind of supports from government, uh, it is important to be a little innovative uh, in doing that. So uh, I, uh, I just wanted to take a few minutes and come by. I don't want to take up too much of your time, uh, but I appreciate what you do. I'm coming back to Florida for a day this, this week, actually. Uh, I miss Florida, uh, but, uh, but I like the rest of the 49 states uh, as well. I'm, this is a big country. Uh, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, take a question or two if I have the authorization to do that. Yes, ma'am. Most TANF funds are directed to states. How can you help us or help the states understand that TANF funds can be used quite appropriately by, organiz by an organization such as Big Brothers Big Sisters, <coughs> where, where we, they really do fit the category of m many of the children. They there. do, and, and some. Uh, are, are there other Big Brothers Big Sisters around the country who have access to TANF funds? Uh, it, it really, to what states are you from? I'm from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. I'm from Minnesota. Minnesota. Texas. Texas. Has, has Minnesota accessed? We just accessed the cannon funds. The, um, the letter that we sent out, and I'll take another look at it in terms of guidance to uh, state agencies with labor, was really focused on, um, on uh, summer jobs, but it was also uh, uh, articulating using local community agencies to do that. Uh, but let me do that. We've had the same issue with states with uh, boys clubs, girls clubs, uh, who have also attempted to, to access TANF. I would also point out that TANF uh, used to be almost two-thirds direct cash assistance, and it's now reverse. Uh, and the, uh, I believe in flexibility for the states. I mean, I, coming from a state, I, I believe in that. Uh, but uh, the extent to which we can give greater guidance, I clearly am, am willing to do that. I think they've got to be innovative with it. I also think you all have to be aggressive uh, because, you know, because they get a lot of asks. Yes, sir. Thank you for pointing out the uh, poverty statistic that 50% of children in single parent families are, are living in poverty. Uh, over 80% of the over 200,000 children in Big Brothers Big Sisters are from single parent families. So uh, we are in that, in that sweet spot. Uh, in terms of working together, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, uh, relative to many other mentoring organizations and youth serving organizations, has uh, tremendous capacity and has been doing research on youth outcomes, continuous research for quality improvement on match strength and match length. And, uh, and we'd like to continue to share that with the Department of Health and Human Services. It may help uh, you all as you're inform and inform you as you're designing and developing programs. I, I would be very interested in that because, uh, you know, this administration has put a heavy emphasis on evidence-based research. And a lot of what we're doing, particularly in the child welfare area, uh, is now real evidence-based uh, practices. Uh, we've made a major commitment to uh, trying to deal with trauma as an underlying element in child welfare. And I think that same thing is true uh, with a lot of the kids who grew up in poverty, is the, uh, you, you know, there are some who call it toxic stress, and that toxic stress has a long-term impact on, on the development of, of that child. Uh, so any research you can share with us, uh, I would be very interested in. Uh, and uh, any of our programs that you um, you feel like you might be able to have some additional insights in, be aggressive in doing that. Uh, I learned a, uh, a, a new motto in Texas, I think, which was, in God we trust, all others must bring data. <laughs> and, uh, and, 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 and I think we've got to recognize that. The, the one thing I do, as, as, as the one thing that I really do, and I am very committed 
to using data and, anal and, and analyzing it in, in an evidence-based research fashion. But I also think it is very important to not lose sight that there are real faces behind that data. And, um, and, 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 and these kids are as diverse as they are individuals, and 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 I th I think that's the real value of this one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, programs that you all are talking about. Is there's a real recognition of that? Yes, ma'am. I think you'll be proud to know our big brother of the year and our big sister of the year and their littles. And I, there's something special you want to know about our big brother of the year and his little brother. Why don't you guys stand up, our bigs of the year, and tell him where you're from? Which one's the big one? Which one's the little? One? <laughs> And we live in Tallahassee. Oh, welcome. <laughs>
and I think states can learn from each other. And I, and I think one thing and is is there to get uh, uh, the APHSA, the American Public Human Service Association, and I don't mind engaging with them. We also just hired uh, someone away from the National Governors Association who who probably knows TANF as well as anybody in the country. So maybe I could sit down with her. And I promised one, and I know I'm violating a rule, but let me. Okay. I think one of the things that we've been looking at is how we can collaborate better with um, different agencies. And the more that I think the government and you all who are providing us resources can encourage that collaboration um, and <clears throat> incent those agencies that work together and get rid of the redundancies would be useful as well. Uh, I, I, I appreciate that, and we will. Let's, let's get together. Let me point one, one thing that we are doing under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the Affordable Care Act, among other things, you know, we can say whatever you want about it. There are a lot of amazing things in that. But what it basically did is it gave 100% federal money to develop the information system for the insurance exchanges, 90%, 90-10 for Medicaid. OMB re, uh, about six, eight months ago gave us a waiver so that states can now plan that large technology system and bring human services into it, and human services doesn't have to share in the cost of the development of the big system. So s information sharing is important, uh, and, and, and I think, frankly, and, and a lot of states in their advanced planning documents have really indicated a willingness to go after those dollars and bring human services in. I think that is a major step in breaking down some of the silos. In, in, you know, in, in Florida, for instance, I had real difficulties, for instance, getting my agency to talk to the Medicaid agency. And yet Medicaid funded a lot of services to the people that we served and breaking down and, and, and I think this technology thing can do that. Thank you very much and uh, come back to Washington. Great. Thank you very much to uh, George for that valuable information. So as we prepare to wrap up here, uh, our final uh, speaker for, to for today um, is a man who needs no introduction, a man who actually in my role as disability policy leader for the administration, uh, his, the um, Department of Justice has done an unbelievable job on civil rights for all Americans, including Americans with disabilities and also who's a man who's a very staunch advocate for mentoring and the benefits of that. And I think you're gonna hear a little bit of that from him today. So without further ado, let me introduce to you the Attorney General of the United States, Eric H. Holder. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So I'm the last speaker, huh? I'm all that separates you from whatever you're gonna do next. Did somebody say cocktails? Whoa, 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 whoa. We got a live crew here. Um, I was told as I walked in though, this is being live streamed, which means like, you know, my fun quotient went way down, folks. If it was just gonna be the, us here, we could have some, you know, good times, some jokes, talked about Congress, but you know, I can't do that now, so. I promise, I promise, I promise. I wanna thank Kareem for those kind words and for all that, um, he and his colleagues at the White House Office of Public Engagement have done to bring us all together here uh, today. This is something that for me is a real, real treat. I started out this morning talking to the League of Women Voters about uh, a whole variety of things that have been kind of in the news lately, um, and uh, you know, voting rights and things like that. And this is, I think, a, a good way to bookend what otherwise has been a, a not really enjoyable day. But so I'm glad to, uh, <laughs> glad to end it with, with you all. It is really a pleasure for me to, to be here with you. Uh, and a privilege to join so many advocates, allies, in, and partners in calling attention to this critical and really growing need for uh, mentors in neighborhoods across this country. Now, for more than a century, uh, Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America has led the way in encouraging community leaders to give uh, of their time and talents to support America's young people, especially those who are at risk and those who are in need. Uh, last year alone, these are really pretty amazing statistics, more than 350 local Big Brothers, Big Sisters agencies served over 200,000 children nationwide. That is very significant. Their ongoing efforts have 
raised awareness about the importance of positive role models and demonstrated the enduring impact that each mentor can have. So this afternoon, I'm proud to stand with um, so many administration leaders, many of whom have come by here. And I understand uh, at least some of you have had a chance to meet the big guy today. Is that right? Who, who got to see the president? Don't hate him. Don't hate him. <laughs> All right. Cool. How, how was that selection determination made? <laughs> Okay. And how, how was it decided who would meet with me? <laughs> Everybody, right? It's all right. No, no, don't try to clean it up. Don't try to clean it up. That's okay. All right. But I am really proud to stand with uh, so many people from the administration um, in celebrating this organization's accomplishments uh, and commending you on yet really another very extraordinary year. Uh, but I also recognize that this leadership summit is much more than an occasion for reflecting on the record of success that you have helped to establish. It also presents an opportunity to recommit ourselves to uh, building on this progress and to continuing the unfinished work that still stands before us. Today, again, some other startling statistics. More than a million students drop out of high school uh, every year. And many of those kids start down the, the wrong path, turning to violence, criminal behavior, um, substance abuse. And just over 2 million um, kids per year are arrested. A third of all children and half of all low-income youth uh, fail to graduate from high school uh, on time. Nearly a third of those between the ages of 12 and 17 have recently reported using alcohol uh, or marijuana. And today, one in four violent crime victims known to law enforcement uh, are children. Think about that. One in four violent crime victims known to law enforcement are children. Now, you've heard, you know, these alarming statistics. Um, you're familiar with the heartbreaking stories and probably have seen some of this harsh reality um, firsthand. You also understand that we have a responsibility to confront this problem, and you've led the way in responding to this crisis, not with despair, but with resolve. By serving as the role models that so many children lack, you've shown how mentors can teach really invaluable lessons, help young people develop the skills they need for future success, and instill a sense of self-worth and self-respect. You have proven that mentors can fill a void, helping to guide and encourage children as they uh, set and achieve goals and develop the confidence ne necessary to fulfill their potential. Now, studies have really consistently shown that through stable and consistent, consistent personal engagement, mentored children are more likely to grow and mature into confident and responsible young adults. Now, one report found that children matched with a big brother or a big sister were nearly 50% less likely to begin using illegal drugs and more than 50% less likely to skip school. Great statistics. Over the years, we've also seen that investing in mentoring programs makes basic economic sense. This is a time of you know, great economic problems we've had in terms of budgets and things of that nature. Uh, in fact, if we were to increase the high school graduation rate among male students by just 5%, Estimates suggest that our country would save close to $8 billion in criminal justice spending. So there's a direct correlation between those things. But as I'm sure we can all say from um, personal experience, one of the greatest joys of mentoring is that the benefits really run both ways. It doesn't just go to the kids. Uh, during my time as the United States Attorney for the District of Columbia during the Clinton administration, uh, my staff and I adopted an elementary school in a low-income, predominantly African-American part of Washington, D.C. I was uh, really thrilled to have a chance to work with these kids on a, on a regular basis, getting to know them, becoming best invested in their futures, and finding a remarkable and rewarding sense of purpose in the relationships that uh, we developed in my office and with that school. As a result, I'm really proud to say that I know well and have seen firsthand that mentoring changes lives, and not just for the students, the prosecutors in my office, hard-boiled, you know, long-time prosecutors, were changed as a result of their interaction with these kids at Amidon Elementary School. And that's one of the many reasons why I've been honored to join the, the President, the, the First Lady, uh, and others throughout the administration in supporting mentoring programs. We've made uh, great strides in bringing stakeholders, including federal officials, state and local partners, community organizations, and leaders like yourselves, uh, together to discuss how mentors can improve educational outcomes and to reduce juvenile delinquency. And I believe that there's good reason to be optimistic about the continued progress that we'll achieve through initiatives like the First Lady's Corporate Mentoring Challenge as additional partners rally to this effort and in the robust ongoing work of today's Justice Department. 
Over the last three years, my colleagues and I have made a strong and in some cases really unprecedented commitment to expanding federal assistance for mentoring initiatives and exploring evidence-based strategies for reducing children's exposure to violence. Since 1994, the Department's Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention has awarded more than $480 million to support mentoring programs. And I mean, there is a direct connection between great mentoring and good anti-crime efforts. People sometimes don't see uh, that connection, but we certainly realize that that exists in this Justice Department. This past March, we announced a $20 million uh, grant solicitation for research proposals that can give us a better sense of which of these programs are most effective. Now, these investments will help to strengthen the progress that's been made through the Department's Defending Childhood Initiative, which was launched in 2010 as part of an effort to help us better understand and more effectively combat youth violence. And it will build upon the critical work that's uh, underway in 10 cities nationwide as part of the National Forum on Youth Violence Prevention. Now, as a result of these really broad-based um, collaborative efforts, I think that we're making meaningful, measurable, measurable progress in assisting the young people who need our help the most. But as you all know, this work is far from over. Countless at-risk youth, foster kids, young people in, in tribal lands, and juvenile offenders rejoining their communities are really still in desperate need of our help. And every last one of them must continue to be a top priority for each and every one of us. Now, it's no exaggeration to say that our nation's future will be defined and its progress determined by the support that we offer and the doors that we open for our young people. But as I look out over this, uh, this crowd today, I cannot help but feel confident in our ability to rise to this challenge and to bring about the change that our young people deserve. Never forget that they are depending on us. These kids are depending on us. And know that President Obama and I, along with so many others in this administration, are counting on each of you to keep up your outstanding work and to continue driving these efforts forward. I look forward to working with you all in the coming months and years to make America what it should be for all of our children. Thank you so much. <clears throat> all right. Well, I guess that brings us to the conclusion of our event today. Uh, a few uh, a few things that I want to touch on before uh, we let you all depart. Uh, one encouragement, and, or two encouragements maybe, and then one announcement uh, of something you all can take with you. Uh, the two encouragements are, uh, number one, uh, we need you all to get involved. Um, and we need you all to get involved for yourselves, for your communities, uh, but for your young people, and not just only on uh, mentoring. You've heard a lot about today about mentoring and, and the things that are uh, great about Big Brothers Big Sisters, um, but there's a lot that this president is fighting for that benefits you all, uh, but, that, but that even more importantly benefits the future of our country, and that's the young people that you all mentor. So we need you all to get involved. We believe that the president, uh, the attorney general, and, and so many others in our administration are fighting for uh, Americans, fighting for uh, Americans to be able to achieve and so uh, we need you all involved in that effort. Uh, the second encouragement is really relates to getting involved and I'll give you an example of you know things that you can do to get involved. Uh, we need you to be aware of what we're doing and the fights that are going on uh, in our country right now. One that I think should be near and dear to your hearts uh, is the fight that's going on right now regarding student loans and I don't know if all of you all have heard about that uh, but the rates uh, for college students, some of whom are here today, um, uh, some college students, uh, the, the rates on college student loans are going to double if Congress doesn't pass action uh, to stop those rates from doubling uh, by July. And so uh, the president has been vocal in his support for not doubling student loan rates and for making sure that students uh, don't have that happen to them. Uh, they are the future of our country, uh, and the president has been pushing for that effort. Uh, we need you all to get involved and support that effort uh, for the student loans, uh, the student loan rates not to double. 
There are all types of Twitter um, hashtags, if you will. They tell me that's what it's called. I'm, uh, I'm not a Twitter guy myself. But uh, there are hashtags involved. I'm sure there's stuff on Facebook. I'm sure the students have heard about it. And I'm sure that many of you all in this room has heard about it. But this is impacting the students that you are mentoring now uh, for those who are in college or who may be getting ready to graduate from college and those who are coming up in the future who are preparing to go to college. And this is an important fight. And so we need you all's voices to be heard and for you all to get engaged and know what's going on in your community and support the effort uh, for student loan rates to not double. That's just one example of the many things that are going on in this country and that are going to be going on over the next five or six months. So I strongly encourage you all, pay attention to what's going on, uh, get involved on behalf of yourselves, your families, and the students uh, who represent the future of this country. So thank you all very, very much for joining us today. We're delighted to have you all. Please stay in touch. Please check out our White House website, as I talked about, and uh, stay involved. And then as you depart here to my left and your right, uh, we do have copies of President uh, President Obama's proclamation from last year on mentoring. I forgot the month that it was. It's National Mentoring Month. Yeah, so it is. Uh, everybody knows that. So we have signed official copies of his proclamation for each of one of you all to take one. So your colleagues get one to uh, take one with you uh, as a memento. So thank you very much. Thank you.